I am not getting, I don't see on my screen, the share screen option. Let me see if I can find it. Because you're not hosting. Ah, but I think the host can select. I, I think so. Ah, there we I, go. I welcome you all to the second flagship webinar of Lex Erudites on the topic, Modalities of Negotiation, its significance in legal academics and profession. After the overwhelming response from the participants for our first webinar on aviation law by Sagar Singham Shetty, we are delighted to conduct and organize our second flagship webinar by an authority and an expert in the field of negotiation. Before introducing the key speaker for today's webinar, I would like to familiarize the, miss the mission and vision of Lexerodites to all the participants. Lexerodites is the brainchild of some young, exuberant, intelligent, and foresighted law students who have come up with the idea to give a platform to students, academicians, and any person from any field to share their independent thoughts on any socially relevant national and international issue. Lex erudites try to collect, collate, and combine your thoughts in the form of blogs and articles into an e-journal, which will be accessible to all. So if the participants are into publishing any blog or article, you can find us on our Facebook site, our Instagram site, or our official website. So kindly subscribe this video to get our next webinar informations. We are eager to read your thoughts. So kindly contribute to Team Lex Erudites. Now, it is my privilege and honor to invite the key speaker of today's webinar, who is joining us from United States of America. The technology have shortened the distance. Now anyone can give us lectures. The expert from anywhere, anyone anywhere in the world can give us lectures on any topic. Today, we are fortunate to have Mr. Professor George Seidel. Mr. George Seidel is a Williamson Family Professor of Business Administration and Professor of Business Law at the prestigious University of Michigan. His authority on negotiation is unparalleled. He is a repository of each and every element of negotiation. Mr. Seidel has served as a visiting professor at the University of Stanford, Harvard, and Berkeley. And the student community is scattered all over the globe, which includes leading business leaders, entrepreneurs, and judges and attorneys. Professor has also authored the book, A Short Guide to Contract Risk, Proactive Law for Managers, a hidden source of competitive advantage, and is a recipient of various accolades, which includes Faculty Recognition Award from the University of Michigan and several other national research awards, including the Hauber Award, the Ralph Bunch Award, the Morer Award for his monumental contributions. Recently, in 2018, he received the Distinguished Career Achievement Award from the Academy of Legal Business Studies. Mr. Seidel has also received many teaching awards, including the Executive Program Professor of the Year Award from the Consortium of 36 leading universities committed to international education. So I invite Professor George Seidel to enlighten us on the topic of negotiation to give some insight about the topic negotiation. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Akhil. And uh, thank you very much to Lex Erudites and to the organizing committee. I've enjoyed working with you in preparing for this program. And I would especially like to thank Shivadeth, Madhu Menon, and Gajender uh, Singh Raj Pirouette and Arun 
Vaidyan Nath, and of course you, Akhil, for uh, your hard work in putting this together. Uh, I'm delighted to be back in India, even though it's only virtually. I wish I was there in person because India is one of my very favorite countries. And my connection with India goes back many years. Uh, many years ago, I was a student at Cambridge University and I visited a friend of mine who was teaching in India. He was teaching in the foothills of the Himalayas uh, in a town called Missouri. And that was my first experience and I fell in love with India. And I've been back several times since then. My latest visit was about five years ago when I gave a, a talk on uh, mediation in New Delhi. <clears throat> but um, I also have taught negotiation near Mumbai uh, in the Kandala Hills. And I have attended uh, on another visit, I attended a wedding of one of my students in Mumbai. It was a Jain wedding. And uh, so I've, I've enjoyed very much my visits to India and I'm delighted to be with you here today. Uh, the committee <clears throat> has developed a list of questions which Akhil is going to use to organize our conversation this morning. Uh, but before we get to the questions, I thought it might be useful for me to give you a framework to think about these questions and to think about uh, negotiation. And so here at the beginning, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about basic negotiation concepts. And also uh, we're going to talk about some basic negotiation skills. And then we'll, we'll focus more on the details of negotiation through Akhil's questions. So when you think about negotiation concepts, uh, let, let's take a simple negotiation as an example. Let's assume, for example, I own a car and you and I are negotiating. Uh, you are interested in purchasing my car. Now, what should you be thinking about as you prepare for our negotiation? Well, if you visit Africa, uh, they talk about the big five. Uh, I don't know if you know what the big five are, if you can name the big five, the most dangerous animals in Africa, the lion, uh, the leopard, the elephant, the rhino, and the Cape buffalo. Well, in preparing for negotiation, also think about the big five. There are five key uh, questions that you should think about as you prepare for our car negotiation. Uh, can you uh, think for a second, what's the very first thing that you should think about in our negotiation? What's the most important thing uh, that you should think about as you consider, as you get ready to negotiate with me to buy my car? Um, there might be some different opinions about this, but I have a very strong opinion. The very first thing any, anyone should think about in any negotiation is your BATNA, your B-A-T-N-A. -A. And BATNA <clears throat> is an acronym for your best alternative to a negotiated agreement. It's one of the most important concepts. If you take away anything from this morning, take away the concept of BATNA, because it's BATNA that gives you your leverage in a negotiation. Uh, if, you, if you look at your best alternative to a negotiated agreement and your best alternative is strong, that gives you your leverage in a negotiation, that gives you your negotiating power. So for example, if I offer to sell you my car for 5,000, but you have an opportunity to buy someone else's car for 4,500, then you have a strong BATNA. Uh, and you can use that when you negotiate with me, you can, you can be a tough negotiator and you can say to me, look, I'm not going to pay anything more than 4,500 because I have a strong alternative. So the number one thing to think about as you prepare for negotiation is your BATNA 
And then when you get into a negotiation, there are strategies you can use uh, with regard to your BATNA. First of all, you have the question, uh, can you find out the other side's BATNA? Can you find out how powerful they are when you're negotiating? And then the second question is, how can I weaken their BATNA? And third question is, how can I improve my own BATNA? So those are three key strategies once you start the negotiation. Uh, can I find the other side's BATNA? How can I uh, weaken their BATNA? How can I improve my own BATNA? So number one of the big five, the thing you should think about always at the beginning of any negotiation is what is your BATNA? Now, second of the big five is what is your reservation price? Um, economists refer to it as your reserve price. Uh, your reservation price is, in this case, is the most that you are willing to pay for the car. So we could just pick a hypothetical number. Let's say that you have saved 5,500 for the car. Uh, that is your reservation price. That's the most that you are willing to pay for the car. So it's important to keep that figure in mind because you don't want to go over that figure in our negotiation. Now, when you walk into a negotiation with me, let's say we walk into a room together, um, do you immediately say to you, do you, do you immediately say to me, uh, look, uh, my reservation price is 5,500, that's the most I can pay. Well, of course not. You never start by mentioning your reservation price. You never mention your reservation price to the other side. Instead, you think of two other very important numbers. One of those numbers is your most likely outcome, your goal in the negotiation. What do you think is a reasonable price for my car? So let's say you could pick any number, but let's say you think a reasonable price might be uh, $4,300 or 4,300. Uh, so you got to have your reservation price and then set your goal 4,300. Now, when you walk into a negotiation, do you say to me, um, I offer you 4,300 for your car? No, no, you don't, you never start with your reservation price. You never start with your goal. Instead, you think of a stretch goal, something beyond your goal, something beyond your reservation price. So in this case, instead of starting with 4,300, you might start with, I don't know, pick a number, 3,500 as the starting point for the negotiation. Um, now, one question that often arises is, who should throw out the first number in a negotiation? If you're negotiating on behalf of a client, for example, um, and you're trying to settle a lawsuit, who should throw out the first settlement figure? Should you throw it out or should you let the other side? When you talk about, when you ask this question to almost anyone in the business community, they will always say, let the other side throw out the first number, because that's a way to gather information about the value of what you are uh, selling. I agree with that in many situations. However, there is a concept called anchoring. And anchoring occurs when there's uncertainty with regard to a decision. And when you throw out a number, the human brain tends to anchor on that number. And so in certain situations where you're very certain about the value of what you're selling or buying, then you want to throw out the first number to anchor them to your number. Uh, you might think of a situation where you go into a marketplace and uh, you're buying some cloth and the seller might throw out the first number because the seller knows what the cloth is worth. And the seller is going to sell, give you a very high number. Uh, it's going to try to anchor you to a very high number. Uh, now, 
this, this stretch goal is very important in negotiation because the research shows that the people who have the highest stretch goal are the ones who are most successful in a negotiation. So your challenge as you prepare for a negotiation is to select a very high number, but not so high that you lose credibility with the other side. If you pick a number that is ridiculous, that you have no, there's no way you can explain how you came up with the number, the other side might just laugh at you and walk away and you lost a chance to do a deal. Unfortunately, I can't give you a formula for se selecting a stretch goal. That's something that you will develop uh, as, a, as a lawyer over the course of your practice, the ability to pick a high number or a low number, depending which side you're on, um, but not one that's, that's so high or so low that you lose credibility. So those are four of the five of the big five that you should be thinking about uh, when you prepare for a negotiation. Uh, what's my BATNA, most important? What's my reservation price? What's my target goal? And what's my stretch goal? And then the last one is also very important. And that is, um, what is your ZOPA? And ZOPA is another acronym, Z-O-P-A. And that stands for your zone of potential agreement. What's the zone in which the deal can take place? Uh, the, the zone of potential agreement is very important in helping you frame your strategy, understanding what the zone is. Now, the problem is um, you know what your reservation price is but you don't know the reservation price of the other side. And so what you want to try to do in any negotiation is to put yourself into the shoes of the other side. The great negotiation, what separates a good negotiator from a great negotiator is the ability to put yourself into their shoes, to look at the deal from their perspective and try to figure out what their reservation price is. Uh, once you do that, once, once you estimate their reservation price, then you can calculate the zone of potential agreement. Because as you, I'm sure you know, or I'm sure you can guess, the zone of potential agreement runs from your reservation price to their reservation price. Using our car example, my reservation price is the lowest amount that I will take for the car. Your reservation price is the highest amount you, you will pay for the car. And so the deal has to take place between that zone, between our two reservation prices. Uh, I don't know if you are, have read about this, but we are having a presidential election uh, in the United States that's very heated and very controversial. Uh, and let me give you an a negotiation example from an earlier presidential election to see how you how you can do uh, with what we've just talked about. So this election occurred uh, many years ago, over a hundred years ago. There was a guy named Teddy Roosevelt who was running for president, and it was in the final days, just a few days before the election, and he decided to take a train trip across America. And on this train trip, he would stop at towns along the way and he would give speeches. And he also would pass out pamphlets with a picture of him looking very presidential. So he had 3 million pamphlets printed up and he was about ready to leave on the train trip when someone discovered that a photography studio held the copyright to the picture. And this was very disturbing to Roosevelt because it was the end of the campaign and he had no money left to pay for the picture, to pay for the copyright permission. 
he needed the pamphlets to win the election, but he didn't want to use the picture illegally. That could destroy him. And so he didn't know what to do. He finally called one of his supporters, who was a great negotiator who worked on Wall Street in New York City. And Roosevelt said to him, I don't know what I, I don't know what to do. I, I can't, I don't have money to pay the copyright fee. I need these pamphlets to win the election. And I don't want to use the picture illegally. What should I do? Now just stop for a second and think, what would you do? What, what advice, if he called you, Teddy Roosevelt called you, what advice might you give him? Now, when I ask this question to my students in class, they come up with some, some very good advice. They say, well, why don't you uh, promise to pay the photographer after you're elected? Or why don't you put a stamp on the pamphlets indicating that the picture is from the photography studio? That would be great publicity. Or why don't you make the photographer the White House, the official White House photographer? He would become famous and uh, he would be, have access to the White House for taking pictures. Those are all great ideas. What did this great negotiator do? He put himself into the position of the photography studio. He looked at the deal from their side, what we just talked about, and he sent a cable to the photography studio. And in the cable, he said, we are printing pamphlets uh, that will have a picture of Teddy Roosevelt. This will be wonderful publicity for the photography studio whose photo we use. How much will you pay us to use your photo? So instead of thinking about us paying them, he flipped it around. How much will you pay us? And the photography studio emailed back and said, I think they agreed, they said, we will pay $250 if you use our photo. Now that is a great negotiator, somebody who is able to look at the deal from the other side. And that's what you need to do <clears throat> when you are trying to think in terms of a zone of potential agreement, trying to estimate what the reservation price is of the other side. So those are the big five that you should be thinking about in any negotiation. What is my BATNA? What's my reservation price? What's my target goal? What is my stretch goal? And what is my ZOPA, my zone of potential agreement? Uh, for many, I, I teach negotiation around the world and for many years, for I think it was around 14 straight summers, I taught a short negotiation course in Bulgaria. And Bulgaria is a very challenging place to, to, to negotiate because you know, Bulgaria, I think, is the only place in the world where the head shake is just the opposite of the rest of the world. So this is no and this is yes. So if you say to somebody, do we have a deal? And they go like this, they mean, yes, we, we have a deal. Uh, so uh, uh, that was a very challenging place. And when I, taught, when I taught negotiation, I would often have students not only from Bulgaria, but from other places. So one year I was teaching negotiation and there were three Russian students in the front row. And I told them how important your ZOPA is, your zone of potential agreement. I said, it's really great to walk into a negotiation with a large zone of potential agreement because then it's easier to do a deal. And when I, when I said that, I said, it's really great to walk into a negotiation with a large ZOPA. They all started to laugh. And finally I had to stop class. And I, I asked them, what is so funny about that? And they said, well, in Russia, your ZOPA is your back end. And so to them, I was saying, it's really great to walk into a negotiation with a large back end. 
So that's one of the challenges in teaching cross-cultural negotiation. So um, I, I told you I was going to begin here before we get to Akhil's questions uh, with a big picture look at negotiation concepts. Now, the other, but the other piece I want to discuss is what are the key negotiation skills? And uh, there are three key skills that I like to emphasize, three basic skills that I think are very important. Uh, skill number one is the importance of getting to know the other side as a human being before you dive into a business negotiation. Try to set aside time to get to know them as a human being. A friend of mine, his name was Roger Fisher, um, was invited by two countries in Latin America, per Peru and Ecuador, to help them negotiate a settlement of a border dispute. They were on the verge of war. And so they hoped that they could settle the dispute peacefully without killing each other. So Roger flew down and he walked into a room that had the leaders of the two countries. And the first thing he did was to, to ask them to go off into private rooms and talk one-on-one -on -one with your counterpart from the other side. So the two prime ministers went off into a room by themselves. The two top generals went off into a room, the two economics ministers and so on. So everybody left for one hour and then they walked back into the larger room. And when they walked back into the larger room, my friend noticed that the two generals looked very upset. And he was concerned about that. So he walked over to them and he said, how did your conversation go? And they said, our conversation did not go well at all. Because when we started to talk, we learned that we both have young daughters who have the same rare bone disease. And we spent the entire hour talking about how difficult it is to obtain medical care for our daughters. And we did not even begin to discuss the border dispute. We failed. And Fisher's, my, my friend Roger's point was, no, you did not fail. You succeeded more than anyone because you got to know each other as human beings. So that's the, that's the goal, that, that's the first skill, I'm gonna call it a skill, is trying to get the, to know the other side as a human being. In one of my executive programs, just for, for example, um, I had a, a lawyer from Singapore and she was in charge of Singapore's free trade negotiations. And she told me, she said, you know, this skill is very important, but it's very difficult for people from Singapore because we, we really like to, we're very linear. We really like to get down to business immediately. And I, I must admit people from the United States are like that too. We, we often don't like to spend extra time getting to know the other side. Uh, we have a phrase here, time is money. We like to get right down to business. Well, she told me that this, this attitude of Singaporeans, like the US attitude, caused problems uh, in her free trade negotiations. She said, for example, she took her team to India to negotiate a free trade agreement. And she said they completely struck out because the Singaporeans wanted to get right down to business and the Indian negotiators wanted to get to know them first, just relax and get to know them as, as human beings. And so she brought her team back home to Singapore. And uh, in Singapore, she uh, uh, had cross-cultural training for her team. The former ambassador from Singapore to India gave them training 
they then returned to India with a different attitude and were successful with their uh, free trade negotiations. I was, I was personally involved with this a few years ago. Uh, I was associate dean at the Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan, and I was in charge of executive education. And when I was in charge, I wanted to expand internationally. And so I set up a uh, Ross School Center in Hong Kong, and that was very successful. And so I decided I also wanted to set up a center in Paris. And I learned that a new business school was being built in the La Défense area of Paris. This is the area of Paris. If you go out um, beyond the Grand Arch, uh, if you go out beyond the Arc de Triomphe first and then beyond the Grand Arch, there's an area with a lot of businesses. And right in the middle of this area, they were building a new university, which I thought would be ideal for our executive education programs. So I, I wanted the new university to give us one half of a floor in their new university to run our programs. And I was very nervous about this negotiation with them because Paris real estate is incredibly expensive. And so I um, flew to Paris with three faculty members and we, we scheduled a half day negotiation with the president of the university and with the dean of his business school. Well, the night before our negotiation, uh, the president invited us out to the left bank to a quaint little restaurant, family run restaurant on the left bank. And we had a very long leisurely meal around a three hour meal. And during our meal, we learned that the uh, president of the university had written his PhD thesis on an obscure British mystic and poet by the name of William Blake. And one of our faculty members, it turned out, was a William Blake fanatic. He loved William Blake. And so they spent the entire evening talking about how great William Blake is. Now, personally, I never want to hear another word about William Blake, but the good news was that because of that conversation, because we got to know them, the next day when we walked in for our negotiation, the president of the university basically said, you can have the half floor and you don't have to pay rent. Uh, he said, you have to give us, of course, a cut of your profits, which we knew we were going to have to do, but without any required rent. And so I, I think I owe that all to William Blake uh, that successful negotiation and getting to know them, spending the time to get to know them before the negotiation. So skill number one is the ability to get to know the other side. Skill number two, and this is very, very important. Uh, the, it's the ability to ask questions. Um, some people think, well, a negotiation is the ability to persuade the other side to do what you want them to do. Uh, and they end up talking a lot. Uh, the great negotiators are the ones who are skilled at asking questions and gathering information because in a negotiation, information is what gives you power. Um, it, there was one study that still shocks me. And that study indicated they, they observed seasoned negotiators, and half of the negotiators did not ask one question. They talked, they tried to persuade the other side, and they missed a tremendous opportunity to gather information. There's a cultural aspect to gathering information. There was one study that compared German negotiators with Chinese negotiators. And what they concluded was that German negotiators asked three times, excuse me, Chinese negotiators asked three times as many questions as the German negotiators. And that means the Chinese negotiators were gathering all that much more additional information that give, gave them additional power 
in negotiation. So skill number two is the ability to ask questions. And then finally, skill number three is related to that. And this is equally important, the ability to listen carefully to the answers you receive. When you and I are in social situations, sometimes to keep the conversation going, we'll ask, we'll ask a question to, to another person. But often we do not listen carefully to what they say. Why don't we listen carefully to their answers? Because we are thinking about what we're going to say next. This is called the next in line effect. If you're the next in line getting ready to speak, you're not thinking about what the prior speaker is saying. You're not listening to their answers. You're thinking about what you're gonna say because we all want to appear intelligent. We want to appear witty. And, and the great negotiators are able to avoid that. They're able to listen carefully to what the other person said and then use that information for a successful uh, negotiation. So those are the big five elements that I hope you will focus on in terms of preparing for negotiation, the big five concepts. And then these are three very basic skills that I think are critical uh, to negotiation success. The ability to get to know the other side, the ability to ask questions, and the ability to listen carefully to the answers. So I've, uh, I've talked too much already, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm now anxious to turn the mic over to Akil so that Akil can uh, focus on some more specific questions with this general background in mind. Thank you so much, Mr. Professor Seidel. And through those examples that of selling a car and the presidential election of Rossville, you have explained the rudimentary of negotiation and the skills required for the same. So my first question is regarding, do you think that in everyday life, we are negotiating with some people in some way? So does all human have the inborn ability for negotiate and to perceive good negotiation? A very good question. And I, I believe strongly that the ability to negotiate is innate. Uh, I think the very toughest negotiations that any of you will face is when you become a father or a mother and you have a two-year-old child, I can guarantee you're going to lose every negotiation because that two-year-old child will have the innate ability to negotiate and to smile or yell and win the negotiation with you. So I think negotiation is innate and we are surrounded by negotiation. We, we negotiate every day with our family members, with our spouses and children, uh, we negotiate when we buy an apartment, when we buy a car, you, going back to my example, if you have roommates, you're constantly negotiating with your roommates. Uh, when you date somebody, uh, uh, you negotiate with where you're going to eat, what movie are you you're going to see, et cetera. Um, and so um, I'm, I'm surprised. I, I teach, and I'll mention this later, I teach uh, an online course that you can take for free and over a million people um, around the world have joined the course and they constantly send me emails describing how they have used the course uh, in business or in their personal lives. Uh, for example, somebody uh, recently uh, emailed me from Singapore. He said he was the CEO, he's an American, but the CEO of a large company. And he used the course in negotiating with one of his suppliers and he saved $4 million. So I, I get positive messages like that about how the course is useful in business. But what surprises me is also the large number of messages I get that tell me how useful the course was in the personal lives 
of the people who take the course and in negotiating with their uh, families and, and friends. So I, I do think that um, uh, negotiation is innate and I do think we are surrounded by negotiation. Just as yesterday morning at this time, I was negotiating with the team who was responsible for setting up this program. And uh, they success. They were very good negotiators. I'm an I'm an awful negotiator. Uh, you you often teach what you can't do, and uh, they were very successful in uh, in changing the format of the program. They're very good negotiators. So does that answer the question, Akil? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So the first question which pops up in one's mind when the idea of ADA alternate dispute resolution is pitted against the concept of negotiation is, how is negotiation different from the much familiar concept of mediation? Okay, um, let me, in answering that, I might be talking about more than what you asked, but I think it's important to step back and to think about the two basic types of negotiation that are especially important for a lawyer. The two categories of negotiation are dispute resolution and deal making. Those are the broad categories. In my own life, um, I never took a negotiation course in law school. When I attended law school, the law schools were behind the times and they were not, they, they were not yet offering negotiation courses. Uh, so I had to learn negotiation as a young lawyer, and um, my negotiations focused on dispute resolution, where people were suing my clients or I was suing somebody else's client, and then we would try to resolve the dispute through a negotiation. The other category of negotiation deal making I learned after I became a faculty member, and when I headed executive education at Michigan, uh, I negotiated constantly with people from large companies uh, where we would, they wanted an executive education program, let's say a, a one week program on negotiation or a two day program or a one day program. And we would negotiate over the place, the number of participants, the content, et cetera. So I did a lot of deal making negotiation uh, there. Now, um, there's, there's a phrase you might have heard of, and that is negotiation takes place in the shadow of the law. And what that basically means is that whether you're a lawyer or not, law plays a very important role in, in both types of negotiation. So let's start first with uh, dispute resolution. Um, now, lawyers, um, if you go back 30 or 40 years ago, lawyers uh, focused more on litigation than they did on uh, dispute resolution or what we call ADR, alternative dispute resolution. But around, around 20 years ago, business leaders started to promote ADR in their work with lawyers. And I remember specifically uh, around 20 years ago, one of the most powerful CEOs in America, his name was Walter Riston and he was the CEO of Citibank. He invited 10, he invited uh, representatives of the top 10 business schools to New York City to meet with him to discuss litigation problems his company was having. And basically he told us, look, we're getting killed by litigation. We're spending way too much time, way too much money on litigation. And he challenged us. He said, why aren't you teaching dispute resolution and negotiation in business schools? So, uh, why is it that we outsource litigation to lawyers and to the courts? Why 
why uh, aren't we uh, resolving these disputes using our business skills? And so each of us went back to our business schools. I went back to Michigan and we all developed courses on ADR and uh, negotiation. Now, um, by the way, um, some people joke. They say that in law firms, ADR has another meaning. In, in law firms, it doesn't stand for alternative dispute resolution. It stands for alarming drop in revenue. Uh, the joke is they, they think lawyers are going to lose a lot of money if, if people move to ADR instead of litigation. Well, what's happened in the United States is, is just the opposite. The large successful law firms have set up large ADR departments. And now those departments are making more money than what the litigators are making in some cases. So what, what exactly is ADR? I'm gonna to get to your question, Akhil. I'm just doing it in a little roundabout way here. What, what does ADR mean? Well, one piece of ADR is something called preventive law. And I don't know if you've studied preventive law in your law schools. If you're like law students in the United States, you probably have not, because in the United States, the focus is on litigation and students spend most of their time reading court cases involving litigation and appeals of trial court decisions, appellate decisions. Um, but preventive law, with preventive law, the focus is on predicting what people will do rather than predicting what a court will do. So as a lawyer, you are trained to predict what judges will do, what a court will do given a certain type of dispute. With preventive law, um, the focus is more on predicting what people will do. And this is a, this is a big problem for many lawyers. Let, let's just take a case that arose several years ago. There was a, a, a very popular U.S. singer named Connie Francis, and she was on tour, and she was staying in a hotel. Called, the hotel was called Howard Johnson's. And, and while she was in her room at the hotel, a criminal broke into her room and raped her. And so what happened after the rape? she heard nothing from the hotel. Now, why did she hear nothing? Well, probably the leaders of the hotel, the leaders of Howard Johnson's probably met with their attorneys and they probably asked the traditional question, which is, if she goes to court, what will the court do? Will she win? And, and probably the attorneys told her, no, she won't win because we did not commit the criminal act. This was the act of an, a, a, an independent party, an independent criminal. And then what else would the lawyers have said to the leaders of Howard Johnson's? Traditionally, what lawyers would also say is, and by the way, don't communicate with her. Don't say anything that could make us liable for this. That's the traditional lawyer approach. With preventive law, instead, the emphasis is on preventing disputes. In this case, a modern lawyer, a good, many, many lawyers still follow the traditional approach. Uh, they, they try to av avoid communicating with the injured party. But, but more enlightened lawyers today would say, look, apologize to her, you know, express your sympathy and concern for her. You can do that without admitting liability. And that is a form of preventive law, trying to uh, predict whether she'll go to court rather than to predict what a court will do. Uh, so a few years ago, just an opposite example, a few years ago, when I was a visiting professor at Stanford, um, I uh, was invited by a, a large company to 
to conduct a seminar for their executives in Texas, in Dallas. So I flew into Dallas and uh, the night before the seminar, I called the front desk and I said, please give me a 6 a.m. wake up call because I have an early morning seminar. Well, the hotel never called me. Now, being a lawyer and being a, looking at the worst case scenario, I had two backup alarms set. So I woke up on time, I gave my seminar, but when I checked out, I was given a little card, a how was your stay? And I wrote down, I had a wonderful stay at your hotel. This was the Dallas Marriott Hotel. I had a wonderful stay at your hotel, except that I didn't receive my wake up call. Well, two weeks later, I received a personal letter from the CEO of Marriott, Willard Marriott, in which he said, I heard about the problem you had with the wake up call at our Dallas hotel. And I want to tell you, I want to apologize. And I, I want to tell you, we're looking into this so it will never happen again. Now that's the preventive law philosophy. Uh, I wasn't going to sue in this case, obviously, but uh, that philosophy, if, if, if there was a lawsuit potential here, that preventive law philosophy would have stopped me from, being, from uh, bringing suit. So one piece of, dis of the dispute resolution branch of negotiation is uh, preventive law. Now, um, Two other key elements of preventive law are, first of all, the two key processes, and then second, some tools that you can use uh, in order to use ADR in your practice. The two key processes with ADR, and this gets directly to Akul's question, are arbitration and mediation. Uh, as I'm sure you're aware from your legal studies, arbitration is really very similar to litigation. I think the best mindset for thinking about arbitration is that it is private litigation. It's, it's, it's very much like litigation, only it takes place outside of the public realm. There's no public uh, court hearing. Mediation, on the other hand, is a negotiation. I think the best mindset for thinking about mediation is mediation is assisted negotiation. Instead of just having the two parties negotiating with each other, they are assisted by a third party, uh, the mediator. Now, um, there are three types of mediation. Traditionally, mediation focused on solving a problem. And so there were two types of mediations that were used for problem solving. Uh, one type was called facilitative mediation, where the, the role of the mediator was to facilitate or to encourage conversation between the two disputing parties. The other type of mediation um, was called evaluative mediation. And there, the purpose of the mediator was not only to facilitate conversation, but also to, to evaluate and to provide suggestions on who would win or lose if the parties went to court. So those were the two traditional types of mediation that were used for problem solving. Now in the United States in the last uh, 15 years, there's been a third type of mediation that has emerged. And that goes beyond solving a specific problem. And instead the focus is on transforming the relationship between two parties who are fighting. This is called transformative mediation to change the basic relationship so that they will not continue fighting in the future. Now, Akhil asked the question um, about conciliation and mediation. I, th I think that was the original question. 
And um, many, to, to many people, conciliation is the same as mediation. Uh, they're synonyms. Uh, but you might, uh, in certain countries or in certain areas, uh, you might find that conciliation uh, has a more specific meaning than mediation. And, and for example, uh, there might be a statute that defines conciliation as a type of mediation where the mediator provides an evaluation, a recommendation to the two parties. So um, uh, generally conciliation is the same as mediation, but when you see conciliation mentioned, always look it up in the statute to see exactly how it is defined. So that, that all re relates to dispute resolution, that one branch of, of negotiation. There's one last piece here I wanna mention with regard to dispute resolution. And that is there are tools that you as a lawyer can use with your clients to encourage dispute resolution. One of those tools is called the corporate policy statement. And with a corporate policy statement, the, the company leaders adopt a company policy that basically says, our policy is to resolve future disputes by negotiation, mediation, and arbitration rather than going to court. So number one, around 4,000 companies, large companies around the world have adopted this corporate policy statement. Second, second tool is the so-called screen. A screen is a list of questions that company leaders answer. And depending on those answers, they will be directed either toward uh, alternative dispute resolution or litigation. So this is a very useful tool for you to use with your, um, with your clients in helping them decide what process they want to use. Uh, the third tool, and this, this heavily involves lawyers, is a contract clause. Um, and there are three basic types of ADR clauses. You're probably already familiar with them, but you can put into your business contracts a clause that says in the event of dispute, we'll negotiate, or in the event of dispute, we will mediate, or in the event of dispute, we will arbitrate. And then you can also stack those clauses. So you can put a, in your, into your contracts a clause that says, in the event of dispute, we will start with negotiation. If that fails, we'll move to mediation. And if that fails, we will, we will move to arbitration. So, so that covers the dispute resolution branch. Now, um, again, we, we start with the notion, negotiation takes place in the shadow of the law. So what we've been talking about so far is the shadow of the law over dispute resolution. Now, the law has a huge shadow over the other type of negotiation as well. And the other type of negotiation, as I mentioned, is deal making. And here, the shadow of the law is represented by contract law. And I won't spend much time talking about contract law because as lawyers, you're all very familiar with the five key elements that you and your clients should be thinking about when you do deals. Uh, first of all, was there an agreement between the parties? And here, with, the, with regard to the agreement, the key element is converting a negotiation into a legal document. And to do this, um, the most popular tool is called a framework agreement. Uh, which in your legal studies, you know, these are called letter of intent, an agreement in principle, a term sheet. Uh, it's basically a skeleton form of contract that helps you convert the negotiation into a legal contract. So number one element of the shadow of the law over your deal making is 
Is there an agreement? Number two, is there consideration? Number three, is the agreement legal? Number four, is the, is the, must the deal be in writing under the statute of frauds? Or forgetting about the statute of frauds, if it is in writing, is outside evidence allowed to be brought in that describes what happens during the negotiation? And this, of course, involves what, you, what you've studied uh, as the parole evidence rule, which, which basically says that once you put your final agreement in writing, then the evidence relating to the negotiation cannot be brought in as evidence. And um, in addition to the parole evidence rule, um, there's something called an entire agreement clause that lawyers almost always put into contracts. That, and that clause says, this is our final agreement and no outside evidence can be introduced. So that's number four, um, the parole evidence rule, statute of frauds, the writing questions. And then finally, very important, the question of agency. Um, whenever you start a business negotiation, the very first question that you want to ask as you begin the negotiation is whether the other side has authority as an agent to do a deal. If the other side does not have authority, then you're wasting your time because that person cannot close a deal without either express authority, implied authority, or apparent authority. So uh, Akil, I've, I wanted to, you ask a very good question, but I wanted to put it into the larger context of the shadow of the law. And really the, the basic message is there are two shadows. One shadow of the law over alternative dispute resolution and the other shadow of the law over uh, deal making and contracting. Thank you, thank you so much, sir. So earlier you had compared the negotiation practice in different countries, like the Singapore lawyer from Singapore, the professional from India, the Chinese, the Russian. So when we compare the practice of negotiation in different countries, whether the psychology of these countries and the approach to negotiation is intermingled with the custom and heritage of that country and how is it relevant when it comes to cross-national negotiation? Aha, uh -huh. yeah, very good question. Um, well, I've taught negotiation around the world. Uh, for example, for many years, I would go to Hong Kong two or three times a year to teach uh, executive programs in Hong Kong, I taught in India, South America, a lot of teaching in Europe. I have an annual course in Italy um, and, and elsewhere. And what I've discovered is that the fundamental concepts and tools that I described at the beginning of our program are very portable from culture to culture. There's um, a lot of agreement that those are the key elements. Uh, what, I have, what I have discovered is that within a culture, uh, often there are differences in attitude. So for example, um, I don't know if this is true in India, but often there's a difference in attitude between people in the Northern part of a country and the people in the Southern part of a country. If I say to somebody in New Delhi, well, um, I'm sure that people in Kerala negotiate in exactly the same way as people in New Delhi, they will become very upset with me. They'll say, no, 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 no. Their, their attitudes and culture is, is very different from New Delhi. Or if I'm teaching in Italy and I'll say, well, I'm sure that uh, here in Venice, uh, your negotiation uh, style is the same as people in Sicily. They'll say, oh, no, no, no. They're entirely different. So even within a country, there are many differences. Uh, also, what I've discovered is there are age differences. Um, 
I, I, I should have mentioned this earlier, there's a fundamental difference in uh, negotiation goals. Uh, some, some people view negotiation as what we call positional. With positional negotiation, it's a win-lose scenario uh, where one party wins and the other party loses. There's a fight over a fixed pie. We have a current president and probably soon to be ex-president who is very much a positional negotiator. Uh, president Trump says, the goal of my negotiations is to win. And for me to win, you have to lose. That's his that's very strong positional negotiation as opposed to the other type of negotiation, which is called interest-based, which is focused on finding the interests of the two parties and building on those interests so that you can create a larger pie that benefits both sides. It's not a win-lose, it's a win-win. Well, what I've discovered is um, in moving from country to country, people generally um, agree with these concepts, but there is an age difference. Uh, and that is older people in countries. By older, I mean, let's say people over 45. Uh, they tend to be more traditional position-based negotiators. Younger people, I, I found, are more flexible in their thinking and more open to thinking in terms of interest-based negotiation, which benefits both sides and which builds a larger pie. Um, I've also found that um, there are some differences between countries that where I, I call them market economies. Uh, and by that, I mean uh, people, rather than doing all of their shopping on a daily basis in a large department store, might go into a market where part of their daily life is negotiating over um, cl clothing, food, Etc. over the essentials of life. So they are built, they have everyday practice in haggling with the other side. And so in a market-based economy, there might be a little bit more focus on positional bargaining than interest-based bargaining. And sometimes there are ethical differences between countries. Uh, so for example, I, I, I've taught in Italy for the last 15 years. And um, sometimes I'll, I'll give them a negotiation that says that the, um, the, the buyer, uh, excuse me, the seller who's selling a house has to receive at least 150,000 for the house. Well, the Italians go out and negotiate and then they'll come back afterwards and i'll ask them i'll ask the sellers how did you do were you successful and they will say yes we were successful we got 140,000 for the house and i said well wait a minute the instructions say you have to get at least 150,000 and they said oh yes we did get 150,000 but you said you just got 140,000 well finally i figure out what happened uh, the official contract price was 140,000 and the rest was paid under the table. Well, I, I discovered, you know, that's part of the Italian negotiation style. They'll put an official price on, on the house, but unofficially they're paying extra under the table. So as I teach around the world, I find examples of this. It happens in the United States, in India, uh, people tell me that uh, there's, there's a difference between so-called black money and white money. Uh, so it's something, you know, there are different attitudes toward ethics from country to country. But so, so my answer is generally people uh, like the focus on interest-based negotiation and the concepts I talked about earlier, but there are some variations depending on, on age and depending on whether it's a market-based country and uh, differences in ethics. Thank you so much, sir. So we have an interesting question from one of the participants, Joanne Manoj Matthew. The question is, is negotiation a zero-sum game? Ah, 
Joanne, very good question. And uh, the answer is uh, yes and no, <laughs> sorry. Uh, but uh, when you talk about zero sum games, uh, you're talking about traditional positional bargaining, a fixed pie. So that the larger piece of the pie that I get in the negotiation means that your piece of the pie is smaller. That's positional bargaining. Interest-based bargaining, on the other hand, says um, let's build a larger pie so that both of us are better off than we were fighting over a smaller pie. So um, the, uh, in many negotiations are uh, uh, positional-based negotiations, fixed pie negotiations. Uh, in, in fact, what, what I would argue is in any negotiation, what you should do is first of all, decide whether it is a position-based bar uh, negotiation or interest-based. If, if it's position-based, then you don't worry about interest. You just focus on how, how big of a piece you can get for yourself. If it's interest-based, then you try to build this larger pie. However, once you build the larger pie, you still come back to fighting over how big of a piece of the larger pie you get. And so in every negotiation at some point, it's going to turn into a position-based negotiation, whether you're fighting over a small fixed sum or a, or a larger fixed sum. Thank you so much, sir. Professor Seidel, now I'm slowly moving to the professional side of negotiation. Now we have talked about the basic concept of negotiation, how it happens. I'm slowly moving towards the question with regard to the real life practices of negotiation. Professor, who is a good negotiator? Or let's say, how can one become a good negotiator? As you have already mentioned about Vatna and Sompa, what are the other tools which one has to use to be a good negotiator and how to effectively prepare for a negotiation? Well, um, I think I would probably be repeating myself, but, but just to summarize, um, I, I think the good negotiators are the ones who understand the concepts that we talked about, the, the big five concepts. Um, they're the ones who keep focusing on the BADNA, the reservation price, the target goal, the stretch goal, and the ZOPA. Those are, those are the concepts that every negotiator should have in mind. And then the tools, especially the tool, the ability to ask questions and listen carefully to the answers. And so I, th I think that um, to be a good negotiator, uh, you should understand those concepts and those tools. And then uh, the ability to practice negotiation uh, through a course uh, on negotiation that includes a lot of negotiation exercises, or even uh, if you're preparing for a negotiation, let's say you're a lawyer in a law firm and you have a very large negotiation coming up, set aside time to practice. Uh, and what's very valuable is if you take the, in your practice negotiation, if you take the position of the other side, that will give you a lot of insight into how the negotiation looks from the other side. I had an executive in one of my courses. He was the president of General Motors of Mexico. And uh, so in my course, we did a lot of negotiations, practice negotiations. And then um, after the course, he was promoted to a very powerful position as head of labor relations for General Motors uh, worldwide. And he had some difficult labor contract negotiations coming up. And he told me that he liked the model from my course so much 
that every Friday afternoon, he and his team would meet and they would do mock negotiations in preparing for their labor negotiations. And he said they had the best results ever having practiced that. Uh, he was later named president of General Motors of, of Asia and General Motors North America. He had a very successful career. But, but, but the point is uh, the ability, not only understanding the concepts, understanding the concepts is like uh, reading a book on how to swim. Uh, you know, you might read about the concepts, but what you really have to do is you have to jump into the water and actually uh, practice swimming to be a, a good negotiator. Thank you, sir. So what are the different kinds of negotiation? Like whether there are different models of negotiation or let's say when a dispute comes, how does one decipher as to which model should be applied to a particular dispute? or whether the dispute can be resolved to negotiation. How can come up with an answer when a dispute comes? Okay, when you're involved in a dispute or even when you're involved in doing a deal, I, I think what you should first think about even before you get to the concepts we talked about like BATNA, uh, ask yourself, what type of negotiation is this? Is it a positional negotiation? or is it an interest-based negotiation? Um, and I, I recommend that um, you should always, regardless of how you answer that question, you should always try to search for interests of the other side and your own interest to see if you can create a, a larger pie. So in other words, uh, Specifically, uh, instead of asking the other side, what do you want? Let's, let's say um, you're involved in a negotiation over, a uh, over settling a lawsuit. And you, you might say to the other side, what do you want? And the other side might say, well, I want an injunction to prevent your client from trespassing on our property. So that would be traditional position-based, the position-based question. But instead, instead of saying, what do you want? Ask, why do you want it? And the person might say, well, the reason why I want it is that uh, my children like to play in the area on my property where you are trespassing and I want a safe place for them to play. And that might lead you to come up with some creative solutions. Maybe uh, it's important for you to use that piece, piece of your neighbor's property, but you could come up, maybe the children could play on part of your property that would be a much better and safer place for them to play. This, this is, I'm just making this up. This is a, a simple example. But the, the point is, um, don't ask the other side, what do you want? Instead ask, why do you want it? To try to get to the, to find out what their interests are. Okay, sir. So you mentioned about the contractual clauses in the agreements. So my question is that since the audience are from the legal background, they would have that question and I'm asking this question on their behalf with your permission. So do you think that the lawyers or law graduates have an extra edge while playing the role as a negotiator and whether law has a role to play in the process of negotiation? Um, and I, I hate to be ambiguous, but I'm going to give a typical lawyer's answer. Yes and no. Uh, lawyers do have an edge because the two basic types of negotiation take place in the shadow of the law. And so lawyers understand dispute resolution. They understand litigation. And lawyers, so that's the shadow over dispute resolution. And lawyers understand contract law. That's the shadow over deal making. So having the law back, plus lawyers are trained to be logical. 
They're trained to uh, focus on the facts. They're, they're trained to be persuasive. Um, they're, they are articulate, clear thinkers. So they have a lot of things going for them. The problem is uh, lawyers have gone to law school and law school has harmed the lawyer's brain in some ways because law school focuses on teaching you how to be a good advocate for somebody, to argue on their behalf. And so if it's a traditional positional bargaining where you're fighting over a fixed pie, maybe a lawyer would do a better job, but lawyers are not well-trained for mediation and for interest-based types of negotiation. Lawyers are more fighters. Uh, than uh, people who are uh, who have learned how to resolve disputes. Uh, law school courses in America don't have any required courses on ADR. Every law school should have a required course on ADR and how you settle cases, how you negotiate settlements. But instead, the focus is on uh, being an advocate. Uh, being somebody who is good at arguing and winning arguments. So uh, we as lawyers have an ex extra burden. Uh, we have to try to overcome our legal training in order to be really good negotiators. So I think the lawyers has to unlearn something to learn the basics of negotiation. Is, is that yes. right, Professor Seidel? You, you stated it much better than I did, Akil. Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> Sir, since negotiation is a discourse between people, how relevant is, the, is to know the psychology of humans while negotiating? Human psychology. Uh, human psychology is very important. And maybe, I, I don't know if this would be a good time, Akhil, for me to mention um, a uh, website that people could go to for a list of psychological tools they can use. Would this be a good time for that? I, by the way, how much time do we have left? I should pay attention to that. No, so we have time. It's up to you, up to your convenience. We can stretch okay. time, it's flexible. Okay, let me, uh, let me go to share screen. Sure, sir. And um, let me... Let's try this. Okay, are, are you seeing my screen? Yes, sir, yes, sir. Okay, this is, this is um, in terms of negotiation tools, what everyone can do is to type in these two words. Oops, I can't spell it, negotiation planner. Negotiation planner. And when you type those two words and do a search, the very first thing that will come up is called, this is a website that I've done called Negotiation Planner. And at this website, can you all, can you see this okay, Akhil? Yes, sir, yes, sir. Okay, at this website, you will find a number of tools. The most valuable tool is what I call the negotiation planner, which will give you a list of questions that you should ask that relate to what we've covered in this seminar. So every lawyer, whether doing a deal making or a dispute resolution can use these questions in preparing for a negotiation. And then there are other tools here, for example, there's a tool that asks you questions to determine your negotiation style. Uh, there are, there's something called a power tool, uh, questions to develop your power using your BATNA. And I described these questions earlier, uh, trying to improve your own BATNA and trying to weaken the other side's BATNA. And this relates to the question you just asked there's a list of psychological tools that you can use in negotiation. One, one example that I gave earlier was anchoring. 
which is throwing out the first price. That's a psychological tool because the other side's brain will focus on that number. Um, there's a contract checklist. These are the questions we talked about earlier. Is there an agreement, uh, authority, parole evidence rule, et cetera? Um, there's, a, there's a checklist here. Should you, should you hire an agent to negotiate for you? And then there are two kinds of negotiation reviews. Uh, after each negotiation, you can use this personal review to review your performance as a negotiator. And if you're working for a company, you can use this review to determine how the company did during the negotiation. And there's one last checklist here uh, called life goals. So let me explain this one because I think this one's especially important in, in working with your clients. Uh, a few years ago, the American Bar Association asked me to give a talk at their annual meeting. And I was honored to receive this information, but they, they said I would be sharing the platform with uh, the world's best mediator. His name is John Wade. And I was especially uh, looking forward to hearing what he said about negotiation, uh, excuse me, about mediation. And so he, he basically said that whenever you're involved in a negotiation and especially in a dispute, you should step back and think about your life goals. And so here I have a checklist of some of the life goals that you might think about. And he gave this example. He said that there was a Chinese couple who were involved in a divorce in Sydney, Australia, which is where John lived. And the husband was a very prominent physician. He was a leader in the medical community. He had a great medical practice. He was making a huge income, very successful. He had many friends. His wife, on the other hand, was unsuccessful. She had tried to start a small business. She failed. She had very few friends. So the doctor and his wife negotiated this, the divorce settlement, and they agreed on most of the settlement except for the last $50,000. They couldn't decide who should get that. And so they brought in John Wade, this famous mediator, and he said to them, you know, what you should do is separately sit down and think, what are your goals in life? Well, the wife did that. She thought about her life goals. The husband refused. So eventually they basically split the, the last $50,000. Okay, came time for their divorce. They walked into the courtroom. And on one side of the courtroom, you have this famous doctor surrounded by many of his friends. They're loud, they're laughing, they're happy. On the other side, you have the wife sitting almost by herself with a couple of her friends, quietly. The judge pronounced the couple divorced and the husband and his friends walked out of the courtroom laughing and happy. They turned right when they walked out of the courtroom and walked down the street to a famous restaurant in Sydney. The wife walked quietly out of the courtroom by herself and as she walked out, she turned to the husband's attorney and she said, now it is time to get even. She walked out of the courtroom. She turned left down to the office of the Medical Society in Sydney. She walked in and she said, I want to file a complaint against a physician. Is this the correct place? And they said, yes. And she said, well, first of all, this physician, my ex-husband, performed an illegal abortion on me. And second, he has been sending drugs illegally to his relatives in China. She destroyed him. He lost his medical license. He lost his positions. He lost his income. He lost his friends. She destroyed him. And I think that the reason 
goes back to this, if his refusal to think about the big picture, if he had thought about the big picture, what he wanted in the future, he would have uh, taken an entirely different approach rather than getting as much as he could from his wife. So I think this tool is an especially important one. Now, at this website, you have this list of tools. You also, if you type, if you hit this link, free negotiation course, you can go to uh, my negotiation course at Coursera, which I realize many of you have already taken. Um, at this website, it says that 793,000 people have joined the course. Um, but actually, because it's offered on other platforms, the total is well over a million people. And you can take this course for free if you want. So um, the link to this course is at the website. Um, <clears throat> you can also uh, buy this book called uh, Negotiating for Success, which summarizes some of the things we've talked about today. And it also um, um, summarizes what I cover in the, in the negotiation course. And as you can see, I've priced it very low here. So it's uh, easily affordable. And I give, I give away all the royalties to my university. Uh, so there's the book, um, there's a company training program. I've, I, I have a Chinese version of the website, but the main thing is using the tools, the free negotiation course and the guidebook. Now, so, so again, to access this, just type in negotiation planner and it's the first thing that will pop up. Now, there is another course that's more relevant to lawyers. And let me go to that one for a second. Um, if you type in, Coursera, which is the platform, and then my name, which everybody misspells, S-I-E-D-E-L, and law, then you will find this course, Making Successful Decisions Through the Strategy, Law, and Ethics Model. So this course is also free and um, this is especially relevant for lawyers because it shows you how to create value through your law practice by linking your legal advice to the strategy of your clients and also by linking your legal advice to ethical principles. Uh, so uh, this goes beyond negotiation, but if you're interested in linking law and strategy and ethics, uh, you might try this course. And then one final note is that I recently prepared a video, for those of you who are interested in ethics, I recently prepared a uh, video. I don't know if you've ever heard of TED Talks, but the TED organization asked me to prepare um, this video on, on ethics. And so uh, if you type in, um, in this case, Seidel, S-I-E-D-E-L, and Burger. This will take you to a video I prepared for the TED organization called the Burger Murders. And uh, it's, it, it's a five minute video that uh, involves uh, a criminal, who has poisoned some uh, burgers in a grocery store. And the question is, what should the company lawyer and what should the company do in terms of responding to these poisonings? And this short video gives you a way to look at uh, ethical, uh, ethical tests that you can use as a lawyer uh, and as a client in making uh, ethical decisions. So those, those are some tools, the negotiation planner, uh, the, the burger murders video, 
And then if you're interested in beyond negotiation and linking legal practice to strategy, the, the making successful decisions course. So those, Akhil, I just wanted to let people know about those various tools. Thank you so much, sir. It will be of great help, the negotiation planner and the course and Coursera and other platforms to definitely help the participants to hone their negotiating skills. I hope sir, so. Admits, sir, admits the COVID-19, the escalation of the pandemic, there's another pandemic addressing the commercial market, the pandemic of commercial disputes. So whether there will be a surge in demand for negotiation after pandemic and what is the scope of taking negotiation as a career as such? Well, um, yeah, it's hard to predict. Um, uh, it, it partly depends, for instance, in the United States, whether there will be new legislation that prevents certain types of uh, litigation. But I think one thing is already clear, and this is something I should have mentioned earlier, but that is that uh, in the future, mediation and arbitration will become more virtual. I've already seen examples um, of um, online mediation and online arbitration. So I think that uh, as a lawyer, um, if you don't already have these skills, you should um, develop your ability to use Zoom or other online sources uh, for resolving disputes, but also for that other big branch of negotiation, which is doing deals. Because at a time during COVID where we cannot fly to do deals face-to-face, -face, uh, virtual negotiations are important, but I think they're here to stay. I think what we've learned, one positive aspect of the pandemic, what we've learned is that um, <clears throat> virtual negotiations can be uh, very useful, uh, not only cheaper, but also produce very useful results. Uh, this is also going to affect, of course, higher education. I just finished a course, an MBA course in Michigan, where some of my students were in India. And uh, just as we're talking here today, it was uh, very much like the classroom experience. What I felt bad about is that my MBA course started at 8 a.m. here in Ann Arbor and finished at 5 p.m., which meant that for the Indian students, they were taking the course all night. Uh, so they, they were very tough and, uh, and did very well in the course, but it was more of a challenge for them because of time zone differences. Thank you, sir. Sir, now I'm slowly moving, changing my shoes to that of a law student or aspiring law student. So the question which pops up is that, if at all I have an inclination towards the subject of negotiation, how should I cultivate that interest? And where can I find the authorities or courses to nurture and grow my interest in the field of negotiation? Well, um, it depends on how serious you are about negotiation. At one end of the spectrum, um, and probably everybody can do this, you can take a free course like the one I just described at Coursera, and many of you have already taken it. I have thousands of uh, learners from India who have taken the course. Yeah, almost every day I receive an, a message on LinkedIn from uh, someone from India who has taken the course. So that's the starting point. Um, but then of course you can read about negotiation. You should try to study great negotiators. Do you have a mentor if you're interning at a law firm uh, or watching great negotiators who are on the other side when you negotiate deals, you can learn a lot from them. So start with a course, do readings, observation, but then at the opposite extreme, if you're very serious about negotiation, you could actually do an LLM in negotiation. Um, 
for instance, in the United States, there are universities like Ohio State, University of Missouri, Pepperdine, where you can get an LLM in negotiation, or you can get a certificate in negotiation from those, those universities or Harvard. And um, if you uh, just Google LLM dispute resolution, you'll find examples not only in the United States, but other countries as well. For example, King's College London, I think, has an LLM program in negotiation. So there's a whole spectrum of, of possibilities, Akil, that, that uh, law students can use to improve their negotiation skills. Sir, earlier you deprecated the practice of law universities in America, excluding the subject of ADR from the syllabi. So how can the universities inculcate the practice or the concept of negotiation, if at all, by introducing a subject, whether that subject will be mostly a subject based on theory or would you suggest it to be a more practical subject? If at all, the universities are trying to include the subject of ADR in, the, in their syllabi? Well, um, I mentioned that uh, ADR is not a required course in US law schools, but I think every law school in the US today offers courses on ADR and negotiation. So I think they should encourage students to take those courses. They also, What's, what has become very popular in the United States are law clinics for students where they might take a clinic uh, where they have a, a chance to practice their negotiation skills and practice their contract drafting skills. So um, if I were a student, I would take every advantage. Uh, if, if you're in the US, I would take every advantage to uh, take those courses. Now it's my understanding that in India, I forget the name of the official body, um, the law council or whatever it's called, uh, several years ago required a course on negotiation in law schools. And, and as of 2020, I think they are now requiring a course on ADR. So um, hopefully that will accelerate the ability of Indian law students to take uh, courses on ADR and negotiation. Thank you, sir. So with that, we come to the end of the session. And I think it was a very enriching session for last one and one and a half hours, where you took the pain to explain the complex, con complex subject in a very simplified, lucid form where anyone could understand. And it was very insightful. And I personally believe that you are a flabbergasting textbook to learn from. Because people like us, I, th I think it's, it, it was really enriching for people like us because there's a new subject and most people do not know the scope of this and how to prepare for this, the tools which you had introduced to us like the negotiation planner and your, uh, and your effective course on Coursera. So thank you so much, sir, for sparing your valuable time in early morning itself, starting with Lex Erudites. Thank you so much. And we were so fortunate to have an expert like you in our session. Thank you so much, sir. Now I invite, now I invite, yes, sir, yes, sir. Well, I just wanted to thank you, Akil, for your very uh, interesting questions. You are, you are a very challenging cross-examiner. And I hope that I never end up on a witness stand in court where you are the opposing attorney. You're very good at uh, your cross-examination. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much, sir. So now I invite Shivadat, a family member of Lex Erudites, to give a vote of thanks on behalf of the Lex Erudites team. Shivadat. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it is indeed an honor for us to have Professor George Seidel as the key speaker for our second flagship webinar on modalities of negotiation, significance in legal academics and prof uh, profession. Sir, so I would like to extend our sincere gratitude and I would also like to thank you for accepting our invitation despite your busy schedule and even the time difference in India and the United States. Thank you so much, sir. 
and we expect and appreciate your support to the Lexero Rights community in the future. Thank you, Shiva Death, and, and good luck with your uh, new venture with Lex Erudites. It's a very exciting venture, and I wish you the best of success. Thank you so much, sir. I would also like to thank uh, our Editor-in-Chief of Lex Erudites, Advocate Akil George, for effectively moderating the session. Thank you so much, sir. My pleasure. Yes, thank you, sir. And yes, uh, we have been receiving an overwhelming response from India as well as other countries. And let me take this opportunity to thank all our participants for making this webinar a grand success. And I hope that this webinar proves to be beneficial for each one of you. And thank you once again. And we hope to host you in our future events. And as our uh, moderator had mentioned, Lex Erudites is accepting articles and blogs on different social legal topics. And please do feel free to get in touch with us if you wish to publish any of your works and we'll get, uh, definitely help you out. Once again, wishing you all a great weekend. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.